Hi, I'm Kyle Perry, and I would like to thank uh, Hope and Amir for the opportunity to present as part of this uh, session on esophageal motility. I'm going to start off talking about manometry 101. So we're going to talk about what is manometry, what is the evolution we've gone through to get where we are today, and then also the technique of how we perform the study and get the data that the rest of our speakers are going to uh, cover during the session. I have no disclosures uh, to, for you. Uh, the objectives here is just what I said. We're going to talk about the goals of manometry, what it does, how we've gotten to where we are today, and then how we perform the actual study. So esophageal manometry is a test that assesses the ability of the esophagus to effectively transport swallowed substances from the mouth to the stomach. And so manometry um, represents a dynamic measurement of how the esophagus does this and does it through the management measurement of pressure. So it gives a quantitative measurement of the pressure generated by the esophageal muscles, the relaxation of the sphincters, and then also the coordination of those contractions. And then when you add impedance measurement to the esophageal manometry test, you can also assess how those pressure changes translate into bolus propagation uh, through the esophagus. A manometry was originally developed in the 1940s. Originally, these used water perfuse catheters where you would pass them down and they had four to eight pressure sensors spaced several centimeters apart and they could uh, generate a picture of what pressures were generated uh, in the esophagus and how these propagated over time along the, along the length of the esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, more recently, the development of high resolution solid state catheters have, uh, we see catheters that look much like the one in the picture uh, right here. So this is a, a solid state catheter with 32 to 36 pressure sensors. They're close together, about a centimeter apart. And then there's 18 impedance sensors along the catheter too. So this allows a much more detailed assessment both of the LES and of the of peristalsis. And then you, when you couple that with computer software, you can generate pictures of each swallow and then composite pictures of all the swallows together to sort of give you a sense of what is going on when, uh, when patients swallow. Uh, the advantages of high resolution manometry, so this picture on the right, rather than showing isolated uh, contractions that occur over from remote parts of the esophagus, we see this composite picture of the transmission of uh, propagated swallows along the esophagus over time and also demonstrates the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, these pictures uh, show the, really the full effect of each swallow from the initiation to completion um, and gives uh, sort of a much better a visual image to go along with some of the uh, values and pressure numbers that um, some of our other speakers are going to uh, talk about in detail. I think when you're gonna do esophageal manometry, whether they're done in the office setting or in an endoscopy lab, preparing the patient for the test is really important. I mean, these are tests where patients are, can be uncomfortable during the test, people have anxiety about the test. And so taking some time to talk through them about what you're doing and why goes a long way towards getting people through the test and having as few people as possible uh, sort of fail the test by not being able to get through it. So first, I always try to make sure that the patients understand why we're doing the test, what we're going to get out of it, and what we're gonna do with the information, because I think that really helps them then to um, really kind of tolerate the test and work their way through it. Let them know that it's you know, gonna take uh, several minutes to do, that they may have uncomfortable sensations in the, in the nose, and that the person doing the test is with them there to help uh, get them through it. There is some risk of nosebleeds and potentially perforation, although they really are a fairly low, except in patients with risk factors. Uh, and also you just wanna make sure you hold uh, any medications that may interfere uh, with the test. This can be an issue sometimes with some anti-anxiety medicines and things that you don't really want people to take beforehand. Uh, the equipment, you want to have the probe that we just showed the picture of a minute ago. 
then you need a transducer cable, the unit capable of collecting the data, and then the computer, which can then take that data that's collected and transform it into a, into a readable format. You also need a 60cc syringe, water-soluble uh, lubricants, water saline, and then a viscous solution if you're gonna use that as well. Uh, the probes need to be calibrated before every procedure. So you have to zero uh, the pressures and make sure that the um, pressure centers are uh, calibrated properly so that the pressure readings are accurate. The impedance sensors don't need to be uh, calibrated, but the function should be identified or be uh, verified before the test. So when you're placing the probe, it's placed transnasally. Uh, then the patient swallows the probe and you pass it down uh, the entire length of the esophagus and into the stomach. And using these uh, guidelines on the screen, you can find the uh, pressure at the upper and lower esophageal sphincters. And you want to make sure that the probe is placed across both sphincters and that you have um, pressure sensors and probes at, that, uh, at those levels. To verify the correct position, you can have the patients take a test swallow and you just see here, you can see the initiation of the swallow, the peristaltic wave and relaxation and re um, contraction of the LES uh, during the test swallow. And so that verifies that you've got that catheter in the right position, you can see the entire swallow and you're gonna get all the data that you're looking for. Uh, the baseline a lower esophageal sphincter pressure is taken during the resting phase. So this is not while having the patient swallow. So you want to have them not a swallow. You can measure uh, the esophageal baseline and the uh, lower esophageal sphincter uh, pressure. Uh, the esophageal body should be relaxed during the resting and the lower esophageal sphincter uh, should be contracted and have tone uh, during the resting phase. Uh, the swallow protocol, the, uh, first uh, we do supine swallows to try to negate the effect of gravity. This is, these are small volume swallows with, uh, and we do 10 uh, thin liquid swallows. And you wanna give 20 seconds per swallow for the, for the uh, esophagus to have a chance to peristals and assess also the bolus uh, transit. Uh, these are both measured simultaneously by the device. And it's important to make sure that the patients know not to kind of get into uh, the rapid swallowing because of irritation from the catheter that they swallow the bolus and then let it be and try not to swallow again until that uh, 20 seconds has passed. Uh, viscous liquid swallows can be done to follow the thin liquids. Uh, this is done primarily to assess uh, bolus transit within the esophagus and see how well uh, the esophagus is able to effectively uh, tran have those boluses trans uh, uh, transfer into the stomach. Optional swallows that can be added include a multiple rapid swallow test uh, to assess peristaltic reserve. A solid swallows can sometimes help identify patients with uh, EJ outflow obstruction if they have intact peristalsis but elevated um, lower esophageal pressures with poor uh, bolus transit. And then upright swallows sometimes can help get a sense of what um, bolus transit and propagation look like uh, under more uh, typical circumstances than what you see uh, with the supine swallows. At the end of the procedure, you wanna slowly uh, remove the catheter and then suspend the probe for 15 seconds. Following this time, you disconnect the probe and then wash uh, in warm soapy water as soon as possible to keep those uh, um, everything clean and working. And that's really the end of the uh, discussion of how to perform a manometry and the basics of what we're looking for. I know the next uh, speakers are going to talk about the data that you're going to get from the uh, manometry machine uh, once the test is over and then also specific circumstances of how we utilize utility. So I look forward to seeing the rest of the session and uh, thank you Sages and uh, Hope and Amir for the opportunity to present.